whistle watchers and welcome to Marseille. Well, that's the group games done. And uh, now on this week's Whistle Watch, we've got Sarah Cox on a Whistle Stop tour. It's fascinating. It's old Leon. And then you get something like this that I can only say represents a spaceship. We'll be answering your Emirates fans' questions and, of course, Whistle Watch. All to come. Oh, now. We're heading into the quarterfinal week, but before we get too excited about all that, let's have a look at some of the decisions that became talking points on the weekend. Let's start with the New Zealand-Uruguay disallowed try, correctly so, and this is why. Now, it's the ball carrier's responsibility to remain possession of the ball. So he loses control of the ball here on before the grounding, and because he's lost possession, it then becomes a knock-on. Now, if the tackler was to deliberately strip that ball, so he goes for the ball and strips it out of the player's possession, then it wouldn't be the ball carrier's fault that the ball was knocked on because it was a strip. But because here he's in the action of making a tackle and not doing a willful strip of the ball, it means it's the ball carrier that has lost possession. So, correct, no try for New Zealand, ball lost forward. Wales, Georgia, two yellow cars, Basham and Nashvili. Now, what we have here, we have a lot of pushing and shoving, and it's quite excessive as well. It's not just a little handoff, it's quite excessive pushing. So the referee, quite rightly so, identifies the two players who caused this, and quite rightly so, gives the two yellow cars. So this is two good yellow cards here, because we don't want to see this excessive pushing and shoving in the game. The game is difficult enough as it is. Now, there's been a lot of talk over the weekend about the ball hitting the spider cam. It happened in a couple of games over the weekend. It's also happened to me in the past as well. It happened to me out in Australia, England, out in Sydney in 2016. I played on. I was wrong, and this is why. So, when we have the ball touching something that is not within the field of play or beyond the touchline, so something touches an object or something that is not usually there on the field of play, for example, like the spider cam, this is what applies. The team last in possession, so the team kicking will last in possession of the ball because the opposition haven't gained possession of it yet. So the put-in will be to them and the place will be where it actually hit the spider scrum, a scrum just down below that. Because we can't take into account where the ball may have gone next or what would have happened next. So, quite rightly so, scrum down from underneath where the ball comes off the spider cam and the team last in possession. So let's hope that the spider cam gets a little bit higher from now on. Fiji, Portugal, some of you are asking why this wasn't a red card. Well, what we have first of all, does it reach the threshold of a yellow card to be sent to the bunker? Yes, it certainly does. It's foul play, we have head contact neck area, so it goes to the bunker to be reviewed. The bunker now will look at, is there any mitigating factors here that I don't give a red card for? And yes, there is. What we have is a slightly step by the Portugal player, which then causes the contact to be where it is. So. A good review by the bunker mitigated down from a red to yellow because of the mitigating factor of that step by the player which then contributes to where the collision took place. And that's what we want from the bunker. Good, accurate decisions. And that's it. I hope you enjoyed this week's Whistle Watch. Some interesting points there, not just on the actual outcomes of decisions, but actually points of law as well. We'll see you next week after the quarterfinals. Right then, let's have a look at your questions. The first one is a tweet from at Macles12. Uh, a question for Whistle Watch. Um, why is it considered an obstruction if a player stands in front of his teammate protecting him from a tackler, but not if the attacking team's player run into the opposition while the ball is passed behind these players? Very good question. Now, you are offside in rugby if you are in front of a teammate who has the ball or if you're in front of a teammate who last played the ball. But you won't get penalised unless you do something to obstruct the opposition 
getting at the ball or getting at the ball carrier. So if you're standing in front of the ball carrier and preventing somebody getting at him, it's obstruction and it's a penalty, unless it's accidental. If it's accidental, it'll be a scrum. Now, the question that you're asking then, what's the difference between the pass behind? Well, if I'm running with a ball, a team is saying and you're doing a dummy run or your dummy pass, uh, and a player runs, he's not going to get the ball, he just carries on running. As long as he doesn't do anything willful to obstruct that defender from following the ball or getting at the ball carrier, then it's not a penalty. And also as well, just remember, if the defender runs into the dummy runner where he could have avoided him to get at the ball, then that's play on as well. So there is a difference. It's all to do with if you believe that the player in front at any stage actually obstructed the defender from getting at the ball carrier or getting to the ball. As simple as that. At Jasper Kemp 9025 asks, Hi Nigel, what would you share as the rugby situation in the Rugby World Cup so far that left you flabbergasted in their beauty and or their simplicity? Oh, now that's a good one. Now, there's been a lot of brilliant moments in the World Cup so far. If you think about some of the tries scored, when the player actually managed to get the ball down, when his airborne doesn't get into touch, a touch and goal, there'll be some absolutely brilliant, some big, good legal tackles, which you want, you want to see the physicality of it. Obviously, the tackle's legal and safe. Um, but I think was watching Portugal play. They really have been a breath of fresh air, haven't they? What they've brought to the game and obviously that win against Fiji as well. Just watching that and thinking everything, they were checking everything at it. And to me, just watching the simplicity of their game has been absolutely brilliant and well done to them. And that's it for your fans' questions. Uh, now it's time for our Whistle Stop Tour. Well, Sarah, I finally made it to the south of France and I'm looking forward to trying out some of your Emirates travel tips. Now, before we all head to Paris, Sarah's got a little bit more of Lyon to show you. So our next adventure takes us here in Lyon and we are about to take a trip down the River Somme. So come with us, come and have a look and see what we get up to. It's fascinating that there is like two worlds that collide on this. So there's old Leon with all this history and steeped in some of the most amazing buildings. And then you get something like this that I can only say represents a spaceship. Down the side of the bank or the river are boats and not only can you have tours, you can have restaurants as well, there are law firms, nightclubs, so there's a whole array of or almost an ecosystem on boats. Come down and see what Lyon has to offer. Famous for some of its food, its wine, there is plenty on offer for you guys to come and check out. Well, that's it. The pool stages are done. It's knockout rugby from now on. Huge congratulations to all the teams who have participated and congratulations as well to Portugal on their historic win on Sunday. More Whistle Watch to come next week. See you then.